I have the pleasure of introducing to you Professor Jennifer Frey, who tonight is going to speak to us about Elizabeth Anscombe on living the truth. Before I tell you more about our speaker, thanks, uh, thanks from the part of the Loom Christie Institute, uh, and I suppose thanks from you all go to the Nicholson Center of for British Studies and the Philosophy Department of the University of Chicago for co-sponsoring today's event. <clears throat> Professor Frey is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the University of South Carolina, Carolina since 2013. Before that, she taught at the University of Chicago in the position of Collegiate Division Assistant Professor of Humanities and Harper Schmidt Fellow, and also she was an active member of the uh, Lumen Christie Institute. Professor Frey has received various grants and rewards and other distinctions, um, and in particular she received her PhD in philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I can testify that she received it deservedly. I, was, I had the honor of being one of, uh, one of the people on the committee and one of her examiners. Professor Frey works in the areas of action theory, ethics, meta-ethics, history of ethics, and various related areas. She has written numerous articles and book reviews in these areas and is working on a number of books. Notably, one of these books, um, Action, virtue and human goodness. She is also about to publish two collections. One of these concerns the topic on which she is going to speak to us tonight, Practical Truth. The other is called Self-Transcendence and Virtue, Perspectives from Philosophy, Psychology and Theology. She is editing this together with Professor Candace Vogler. Professor Vogler and Professor Frey were together principal investigators of an ambitious and imposing long-term project under the title Virtue, Happiness, and the Meaning of Life, sponsored by the John Templeton Foundation. Her topic tonight is one on which she has been giving a lot of, to, to which she has been giving a lot of thought over the last couple of years, and she is, I think, uniquely qualified to talk about it. You may think that Professor Frey should have given her talk a bit earlier um, because um, truth is uh, on the way out, it's uh, obsolete. <laughs> I, I heard this on the news re recently. We have moved from the age of post-modernity to the age of post-truth. Now perhaps the news was just fake news. Um, <laughs> especially given the fact that we are living in age of post-truth. <laughs> Never mind. Um, perhaps we'll be clear about this matter once we have heard Professor Frey give her talk. Please. Thank you, Anselm. Um, I would like to thank uh, Thomas Levergood and the Lumen Christie Institute for inviting me to speak tonight. It's always a pleasure and an honor to speak here at the University of Chicago, but it's a special treat for me to give a lecture for Lumen Christie. It's an institution for which I have enormous respect and that occupies a special place in my heart. So thanks to Thomas. This evening, I'm gonna be speaking about Elizabeth Anscombe and practical truth. My talk will be divided into three parts. The first part of my talk will be devoted to saying some things about Anscombe's person and her life. Although Anscombe is surely intriguing in her own right, there are certainly many legendary stories that circulate about her. My reasons for going into her personal biography are ultimately philosophical. For we see in her life, and in an especially illuminating way, the concept I wish to explore with you this evening, the concept of a specifically practical form of truth a form of truth that is exemplified in a well-lived human life. Anscombe exemplified practical truth, that is to say, she lived the truth, in the very sense I hope to make philosophically articulate, 
So we shall begin by turning to her life for some pre-theoretical material to draw upon. The second part of my talk will be concerned with what Anscombe herself said about the concept of practical truth and its importance for both action theory and ethics. The third and final part of the talk will try to begin to show how practical truth relates to practical wisdom and our understanding of the virtues and what it means to live well as a human being. So part one, the life and character of Elizabeth Anscombe. Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe was born on March 18, 1919 in Limerick, Ireland, where her father, then a British Army officer, was stationed. In 1937, she entered Oxford, where she read Mods and Greats at St. Hugh's College. In her first year at Oxford, she formally converted to Roman Catholicism after having been raised in a religiously indifferent household. This places her in the venerable tradition of those who studied their way into the Catholic faith and thus placed themselves under its demanding canonical norms out of a deep and abiding intellectual commitment. Anscombe did this, like many people, despite the protestations of her family and other obvious negative social consequences. In 1938, she met another philosopher, Peter Geach. They married in 1941 after she graduated. The following year, she was awarded a research fellowship at Newnham College, Cambridge, where she stayed until 1945. It was during this time that she met Ludwig Wittgenstein and attended his lectures. When this fellowship expired, she was elected to a fellowship at Somerville College. At the time, that was the Women's College at Oxford, remaining there until 1970. And I think it bears mentioning that Oxford only admitted women beginning in 1920. And certainly when Anscombe was an undergraduate in her early career, it was a place that was hostile to the presence of women. Despite being appointed at Oxford, Anscombe made weekly trips back to Cambridge to meet with Wittgenstein, who became her close friend. Although Wittgenstein has been called a misogynist for his negative attitudes about women, he was deeply impressed by, admired, and trusted Anscombe, and he affectionately addressed her as old man. He trusted her enough that he appointed her as one of his primary literary executors and translators. Her translations of his works most famously, her translation of his philosophical investigations have become modern classics. In 1970, Anscombe was appointed to the chair Wittgenstein had occupied at Cambridge, a position she held until her retirement from teaching in 1986. She had visiting appointments all over the world, including here at the University of Chicago. The Anscombe Lounge is just down the hall. Anscombe's philosophical accomplishments are too impressive to list in detail, but suffice it to say that the following is undeniable. She made considerable impact in all the major areas of philosophy, ethics, action theory, philosophy of language and mind, and even metaphysics. Her only monograph and tension, as well as many of her papers, are considered classics of 20th century analytic philosophy. Anscombe's final lecture was titled Doing the Truth, and her final publication, Practical Truth. There's something fitting about this, as Anscombe was a philosopher who stood out, and that she was not simply interested in knowing the truth, but living it. And she saw that there is a difference between these two ways of being related to reality. Anscombe's life was marked not only by a well-trained desire to know reality, to grasp it as it is, but the will to conform herself and her actions to it. She put her formidable intellect and her considerable philosophical talents in the service of truth, rather than in the service of other political ends and goals. And I think she had little patience for those who didn't share the same seriousness about the truth that she did. Although Anscombe lived the intellectual life, she was not withdrawn from practical affairs. But her obedience to the truth is manifest in her practical life in very deep and obvious ways. I will briefly mention just a few of them. In 1939, at the age of 20, Anscombe published a pamphlet protesting British rhetoric and policy leading up to its involvement in World War II with the title, The Justice of the Present War Examined. The pamphlet denounced both the government's aims and the means by which it was very likely to pursue them. It predicted with stunning accuracy much of the immoral behavior that the British government would eventually engage in during the war. In 
What Anscombe found most reprehensible was her government's popular rhetoric regarding the so-called indivisibility of modern warfare, such that the civilian population is considered combatants, such that direct attacks upon their life are justified. Seven years later, when she was a fellow at Somerville College, Oxford, Anscombe opposed Oxford's move to award President Harry S. Truman an honorary degree. Anscombe opposed this on the grounds that Truman, as the person who gave the order to drop atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, was a mass murderer. Anscombe called it murder because it was a calculated choice made by Truman to intentionally kill innocents indiscriminately for the sake of his further goals. Only three people at Oxford supported her vote. And I think Anscombe was deeply scandalized by this fact. But her shock moved her to do the hard work of articulating and attacking the degenerations of thought that seemed to her to lurk behind her contemporaries' approval of Truman's war crimes. The arguments for Truman's decision fall under what Anscombe termed consequentialism. The idea that if the consequences for one's actions bring about more good than evil, the act is not only permissible, but morally required. Anscombe attacked this view in her influential essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, published in 1958. She attacks it philosophically as resting on a problematic account of intention. But she also notes that the view is radically out of joint with Judeo-Christian morality, which has at its animating core a doctrine of absolute moral prohibitions including, most obviously, an absolute prohibition against murder. She saw that consequentialism presents a direct attack upon the principle articulated by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, that we may never do evil, that good may come. Anscombe's commitment to living the truth certainly put her on the outs with the dons at Oxford and with the broader culture at large, but it also made her the subject of vociferous and uncharitable attacks. So on your handout, there's a lovely little reply to one such vociferous and uncharitable attack by Bernard Williams, which I think is funny. I'm not going to read it. Um, but it also put her at odds with some of her co-religionists. In a famous debate with C.S. Lewis, Anscombe destroyed one of his central arguments for theism. While some were dismayed that she would so ardently oppose a well-known apologist arguing for the existence of God, Anscombe simply saw herself as fulfilling a duty to expose what she took to be poor reasoning. With her husband, Peter Geach, Anscombe had seven children. It strains credulity to think that she gave herself over to the creation and maintenance of a large family for personal gain or because she was simply smitten with domestic life. The demands that motherhood placed on her at a time when few women worked outside the home let alone had the demanding career of an internationally acclaimed academic were obviously difficult and taxing. But Anscombe clearly believed that the Christian ideal of chastity revealed a deep truth about the human person. And she further believed that the practice of artificial methods of contraception were opposed to its cultivation and growth. These beliefs were at the time, and obviously still are, deeply unpopular even among Roman Catholics, both lay and clerical. But again, Anscombe followed the truth where she believed it took her. Anscombe was willing to be arrested for her convictions and was not averse to public protest. She was arrested twice at abortion clinics in her advanced age. Although her conservative fans tend to downplay her public opposition to World War II, Harry, World War II, Harry Truman, the Vietnam War, and nuclear armament, her progressive fans are equally embarrassed and pass over in silence her commitments to the inviolability and worth of each human person at every stage of human life and traditional ideas of chastity. Certainly, it would be very difficult to characterize Anscombe in terms of our ready-to-hand political categories, precisely because her thought and reasoning simply did not bend itself to conform to the goals of any political party or agenda. Finally, although Anscombe was a devout and committed Catholic, many of her friends, close collaborators, and students were not. In fact, many were committed atheists who disagreed with her on matters of great consequence. 
What allowed Anscombe to enter into these relationships in a deep way, I suspect, was her desire to understand, a desire which led her into deep intellectual friendships with others who shared it. And what her students and colleagues admired about her, it seems, was not simply her manifest brilliance, although she was manifestly brilliant, but her dogged pursuit of the truth and her willingness to pursue it as Wittgenstein had taught her the bloody hard way. Okay, so that's Anscombe. Now, practical truth. So I've claimed that Anscombe's life was marked by a desire not merely to know, but to live the truth. When we speak this way about truth, we are registering a relation to it that takes on a characteristically practical mode. It is this practical conception of truth that I now want to draw our attention to. How do we situate thoughts about practical truth, especially since it's not a concept that seems to have survived medieval philosophy, and so it's foreign to much of contemporary thought? It seems reasonable then to begin with Aristotle, as the concept of practical truth comes from him, and Anscombe's own discussion of it is anchored in his. But Aristotle doesn't give us much to go on. Aristotle mentions practical truth exactly once. It's on your handout. It's from book six of the Nicomachean Ethics. It occurs in his discussion of the virtues that perfect our intellectual powers. So our powers to know. The attainment of truth, he writes, is the work of any intellectual capacity. It provides a measure of its success or its failure. So a judgment's true if it's good. It's bad if it's false. Now Aristotle further marks a division between cognition and desire, and onto that he grafts a separation between intellectual virtue, so those are the virtues that perfect our powers for knowledge, and moral virtue, those that perfect our powers to desire what one perceives or judges is good. Now, since knowledge and desire are the primary sources of action, these powers must be habitually, habituated properly in order for someone to act well. Wisdom allows us to judge and reason well about the most important things in life and is primarily about grasping and applying principles. But moral virtue allows us to realize what is judged well in our actions and it is primarily about wanting things in accordance with reason's judgments. To live well requires both well-habituated well intellect and appetites such that what one asserts, as a matter of fact, it is good to do, and what one pursues in one's actions align. If these conditions are in place, Aristotle thinks that we can speak of, quote, practical thinking and of the attainment of a truth that is practical. He calls it the truth corresponding to right desire. Okay, so I'll limit myself to making just a few necessary points about this passage, insofar as I think they will help us to understand Anscombe's analysis of it. First, it's worth mentioning that when Aristotle speaks of practical thought and reasoning, he means thought and reasoning that is essentially aimed at acting. So it's thought undergone from the first person perspective with a view to acting rather than merely knowing. Aristotle did not think that knowledge sufficed for action, let alone acting well. So just to gen up some evidence for this idea that knowledge is not sufficient for action, we can think of the four types of agents that Aristotle outlines in the Nicomachean Ethics. That's the virtuous, the vicious, the ocratic, and the encratic. So to illustrate the difference, you can think of four different people at a party, all being served drinks. So the virtuous person drinks the appropriate amount, enough to enjoy the pleasures of drinking, but not too much, not so much as to impair his reason or his health. This person both knows and desires the right action and therefore makes a right decision and acts well with ease and pleasure. The vicious person gets drunk, not even realizes that in so doing he is failing to act well. So he thinks wrongly, he's just living his best life, and he's also, for the moment at least, really enjoying himself. Now the encratic, or the merely self-controlled person, knows that he shouldn't have that third glass of his host's rare bourbon, but he really wants the third glass, and though he refrains, he leaves the party feeling the loss of the good he has denied himself. 
So he's suffering a little bit. So he chooses the right action, but he doesn't do so wholeheartedly. He does it in a divided way and with difficulty. Now, this guy is clearly better than the drunk, and his action deserves praise, but his action also still falls short of the kind of human excellence that virtue exemplifies. OK, and lastly, we have the ocratic person at the party. He also knows he shouldn't have that third glass of bourbon. Like the incratic, he still really wants it. Unlike the incratic, he lacks all self-control and does what he knows he ought not to do. And he later regrets his choice, right? So he knows he shouldn't have the drink, and he drinks it anyway. That's a thing that humans do. Strange and mysterious. OK, so the fourfold division just shows that knowing does not suffice to explain a good choice and certainly does not give us a full measure of acting well. Acting well, as Aristotle insists, requires a true logos that is in agreement with right desire. And so practical thought is excellent only insofar as it agrees with right desire, which makes executing one's choices easy and enjoyable. The second thing to say is that practical thought begins with something wanted, so some human good that's at a distance, and makes its way down to an action that could realize that good here and now. So it moves from the general and the abstract to the particular and the concrete. Thought is not practical because it's thought about the good or the human good or even my own good. It's practical because of its starting points and its goal. Now, if practical thought essentially aims at acting such that the proper conclusion of practical deliberation is an action, then practical judgment is of the kind that terminates an action. This is at least how Anscombe reads Aristotle. You can see on the quotes in the handout. Um, she argues for this in the first essay she wrote on practical truth in 1965. She writes that we can speak of practical truth when, and this is a quote, the judgment involved in the formation of the choice leading to the action are all true. But the practical truth is not the truth of those judgments. It is truth in agreement with right desire. OK. Now, while I agree with the spirit of what Anscombe says here, I would ever so slightly restate her claim by saying, Practical truth is not the truth of those judgments simpliciter. For if truth is the proper work of the intellect, then it must be the judgment that is true. That is, the judgment must be the bearer of truth. But what makes the truth practical is that it is in agreement with right desire. And this agreement is part of our evaluation of the judgment itself because of the kind of truth that pertains to it as a practical judgment. So it's not regular old truth plus something else, right desire, precisely because it's not regular old judgment plus some other condition. To say that, I think, misunderstands the nature of practical thought, reasoning, and judgment whose characteristic activity is to attain the kind of truth that agrees with right desire and leads to the execution of a good choice in action. OK, so I think it might help to explain this difference um, if we look to the differences between theoretical and practical judgment. So to bring out these differences, I'll just consider two different judgments. Judgment one, Thomas Levergood is sitting in the third row. Let's assume, as the evidence suggests, that this is true. So long as I have grasped things aright, the judgments it's true. It's just true as a judgment. It's good. Um, nothing more needs to be done. Now, consider a second kind of judgment. I should brush my teeth before my talk. This seems like a good thing to do, so let's just assume that that judgment is also true. Now, in order for that judgment to be practical, rather than a theoretical judgment about a practical matter, I have to have made it within a deliberative context. That is to say, with a view to bringing it about that I will brush my teeth, before my talk. So it must arise because of something I want, to have pleasant interactions with my colleagues, to keep up appearances, and thereby become the grounds of a choice that I realize in action. But if I never brush my teeth, let's say because I forget, because I plan my time unwisely, 
then the judgment fails to be fully what it ought to be as a judgment, i.e. practically true. For the judgment to attain practical truth, I have to brush my teeth at the appointed hour, and that takes agreement with right desire. So because practical judgment comes from and is ordained to deliberative desire or choice, its well-functioning is exemplified and acting well. Of this sort of truth, Anscombe writes, and this is a quote from your handout, that it, the truth, is brought about, made true by action, since the description of what one does is made true by his doing it, provided that a man forms and executes a good choice. Now, Anscombe obviously does not mean that the act of brushing my teeth is what makes it true that I ought to brush my teeth. Rather, she thinks that the practicality of the truth lies in the fact that I bring about an event that is true under intentional descriptions that come from the practical judgment that I've made that I ought to brush my teeth. Of course, not every action will produce practical truth in this sense. The actions of the wicked man or the weak-willed or the just plain ignorant will produce practical falsehood. So Anscombe writes, the man who forms and executes an evil choice will also make true some description of what he does. He then will have produced practical falsehood. Okay, so briefly, here's how I interpret Anscombe's remarks on practical truth. Practical truth is fully secured by actions that can be truthfully described at the most general level of intentional description as living well. Although the bearer of practical truth is a judgment, because practical judgments are the formal causes of both choice and action, there is a sense in which practical truth can be applied directly to actions as Anscombe insists, insofar as an acting an agent makes true the descriptions under which she acts as indicative of her practical and judgment, of her practical judgment and choice, all the way up to the most general vol voluntary action description of living well. Judgment alone doesn't secure practical truth because the judgment is only fully practical when what is judged true is made true in action, which it does by being in agreement with right desire. To make sense of practical truth in this sense, I think we need to defend six theses. One, that we act under intentional descriptions that are objects of practical knowledge, and in so doing, make those descriptions true of our bodily movements. These descriptions, two, these descriptions can always be subsumed under more general human action descriptions. Three, every human action is a moral action, so it's the kind of thing that can and ought to be characterized truly as living well. Four, we can make lower level particular descriptions of action true, while at the very same time be making higher level more general action descriptions false. Five, insofar as enacting, we make the description living well false by what we do, we're creating a practical falsehood, and our action and our practical reasoning can be criticized. Six, truth comes in degrees. Only the phronimos or the practically wise possess the fullness of practical truth, and it is exemplified in their lives. Okay, so I'm going to dispense with these claims now. I'm just going to say how Anscombe gets to them, or how I think she gets to them, but I'm not going to argue for them, although I'm happy to argue for them with you in the Q&A. So the first claim, that we act under intentional descriptions that are objects of practical knowledge, that's the stuff of intention, a monograph that Anscombe published in 1958. In order to motivate the importance of intentional descriptions of actions, we can notice that any time we act, we cause many things to happen. So to borrow a famous example from Donald Davidson, Jones walks into a room and flips a light switch. In so doing, Jones moves a bunch of particles about. He tenses and flexes such and such muscles. He raises his arm. He illuminates the room. He casts a shadow on the wall. He produces a clicking noise. He wakes up the unsuspecting dog. He alerts a prowler to the presence of the owner of the house, and so on. All of these descriptions of what Jones does are in a familiar sense perfectly true, but not all of these descriptions pick out what Jones causes to happen as a matter of his will and practical reasoning. Those are the intentional or voluntary descriptions, 
A theory of action, Anscombe thinks, must give some way to sort out intentional from non-intentional descriptions of what a person does. Now, one thing that Anscombe makes clear is that an intentional description is the one the agent applies to her own actions through a certain kind of knowledge of them. So Jones can't be intentionally alerting the prowler if he has no idea that a prowler is there. Anscombe calls the knowledge that a person has of what he does under intentional descriptions practical knowledge. One displays this kind of knowledge when one is able to give sincerely true answers to a special sense of the question why. True answers are supposed to reveal the agent's reasons for acting. Now, we might notice in general that when we ask someone why they're doing whatever we can see that they're up to, their answers typically relate the present action to something else that they're also doing. For example, I am standing at a podium reading this sentence because I'm giving a talk. I'm giving a talk because I'm an assistant professor building my CV. I'm building my CV in order to get tenure. <laughs> I'm seeking tenure because I'm an academic, and so on. But ultimately, you could ask me why I'm an academic. Here the answer is going to be that I love the intellectual life. Reading, writing, and thinking are activities I find rewarding, despite how much they challenge me. Now, what my answers to the why question bring out are my reasons. And my reasons are ultimately cashed out in terms of the ends or goods that my actions are ordered to realize. Since the will is the capacity to make things happen in accordance with our practical thought about what ought to happen, what is an object of will must be known under descriptions that connect the action descriptions to one's further ends or goals and ultimately to one's vision of how to live. Without such a vision of what is good or bad in human life quite generally, what is worth pursuing and what worth avoiding, we would not have reasons for acting at all and we would not be able to answer the why question. So human actions are rationally ordered, but the order we find inscribed in them comes from practical reason and will. We discover this order through reason and impose it on the world through our action. So the unity of my action and the unity of my life comes from the joint work of practical reason, judgment, and will. So at present, you could say, I'm realizing my practical thought and decision in my bodily movements. My judgment that I ought to give a talk in light of my desire to build my CV so I can continue the great privilege of living the intellectual life explains my choice to give the talk and to do what was necessary to make it true that I am presently giving it. What explains the fact that I know what I'm doing right now in a non-observational and immediate way is my first personal knowledge of the order of reasons and desire that makes these particular bodily movements and sounds into a unified action that can truthfully be called giving a talk. In doing what I presently do, I am making that order of description of events practically true in Anscombe's sense. Now, if the unity of an action just is the unity of an agent's practical reasoning, as Anscombe argues that it is, then we would expect to see this unity displayed in an account of the practical syllogism, which makes articulate the structure of rational deliberation. The practical syllogism is a formal representation of a practical argument that displays how the performance of a human action, which is the conclusion of the syllogism, <coughs> preserves the good articulated by its major premise through the means stipulated in the minor premise. Now, the starting points of practical reason in the case of the practical syllogism, is not a representation of the content of some possible belief or judgment, as is the case in a theoretical syllogism. It's a representation of a possible object of will or an intention. This, in conjunction with premises stipulating the suitable means to realizing it, yields an action that preserves the good stated in the first premise. The action is made practically intelligible in light of the premises which Anscombe argues shows what good or what use the action is. So intentional descriptions of actions are the ones that can figure in such a syllogism, should one bother to make one. These are the descriptions that pick out, among the many things that an agent is causing to happen, the one that she causes to happen in accordance with her practical reason and will. <coughs> 
So if we can speak of a practical form of reasoning and knowledge, we might also speak of a practical form of inference. In a paper, Practical Inference, Anscombe notes that inference is related to the concept of validity, and moreover, that the validity of an inference is supposed to be of a certain formal character, the appreciation of which is connected with the evaluation of grounds, qua grounds. She argues that if there is a unique form of practical inference, its validity will have a different kind of ground from the validity of theoretical inference. She writes, in the sphere of practical reasoning, goodness of the end has the same role as truth of the premises has in theoretical reasoning. Now, Anscombe seems to think that practical inference is unique because the starting points of practical reasoning are objects of desire rather than belief. It's because the starting points of practical reasoning is an intention for an end Practical inference from this general intention to some specific concrete action that will realize it is goodness preserving in her sense. By contrast, since the starting point of theoretical reasoning is some belief that is taken to be true, the inference from this belief to some further conclusion is truth preserving. So just to put this slightly more formally, uh, maybe for the philosophers in the room, we can say that the rules of valid argument in the theoretical mode are designed to ensure that in reasoning, one will never pass from something that is true to something that is not true. If there are rules for practical inference, they must ensure that the inference conforms to a pattern that will never lead from an end that is good to the pursuit of an action ordered to an end that is bad. Just as the truth of the premises is communicated to the truth of the conclusion in a valid theoretical argument, so the goodness of the initial practical premise, the desire for a good human life or doing well, is communicated to the conclusion, which is, which is acting in a way to realize it concretely through your action. So then the syllogism will be practically valid if its conclusion is the execution or realization of the order outlined in the premises. And if what is so specified meets some determinate measure of correct calculation, i.e., if what is chosen is a legitimate means to an end, an action that manages to meet this criteria will be practically true in Anscombe's sense. Drawing the conclusion or acting is a kind of making true of the intentional order, a making true that preserves the goodness of the end intended in the first premise and preserved through the second premise specifying the means. In the case of a valid practical syllogism, what is made true is that what happens comes under the intentional descriptions specified in the premises. This is the truth one produces in acting, or truth in agreement with desire. We might say then that practical truth preserves the good from thought to action. But just as validity is not the final analysis of an argument, a good argument must also be sound. So truth in agreement with desire is not sufficient for practical truth in the fullest degree. This would be truth in agreement with right desire or the realization of intentional descriptions that are not merely a correct means to one's end, but moreover are really instances of living well, so correct means to an end that is really good. The truth about what ends living well consists in will be grounded in the reality of the human person and its surrounding world. When the logos is true, Practical principles have been correctly grasped and applied to the circumstances, and a sound practical judgment about what to do is made. OK, so finally, I should say that I think practical truth is predicated not only relative to the content of descriptions and their form, but also the level of generality of description itself. To see this, I will just borrow a famous example from intention of a man pumping poisoned water into a cistern in order to replenish the house water supply. As Anscombe describes this person, he's performing those actions for the sake of poisoning the Nazis that occupy the house. Anscombe tells us that the man who contaminated the source has calculated that if these people are destroyed, some good men will get into power who will govern well, or even institute the kingdom of heaven on earth and secure a good life for all people. Now, while the man makes the intentional description, pumping poisoned water into the cistern and poisoning the Nazis true by his action, he's also making the more general act description of murder 
or acting unjustly practically true. But he is not making it practically true that he is bringing about the kingdom of heaven on earth, and certainly not that he's living well. He is not realizing an event that is true under those more general descriptions, because his calculation is an error. So I guess the thing that I want to note about this is that Anscom is placing herself, I think anyway, in the Aristotelian Thomist tradition by thinking that human action is moral action, which is just to say that every human action is capable of being truly or falsely described as living well. So that would be like the highest level of intentional action description. So the highest level of description will be that of living well or living a good human life. On this account, practical truth comes in degrees and it's relative to intentional context. The fullness of practical truth is something that only the practically wise possess. But insofar as one acts intentionally at all and has some practical knowledge, likewise, it seems to me and to Anscombe that one has some possession of practical truth. Okay, so my last section is practical truth and virtue. In closing, I want to say a few things about how I understand the concept of practical truth figuring in our account of virtue and the excellent or happy human life. Since time is short, I'll be very brief. Let us assume with Aristotle and Aquinas that virtue is necessary but not sufficient for living well. Virtue perfects our human capacities such that we are able to direct them towards the creation and maintenance of a good human life. The virtuous person is the one who possesses practical truth and lives well. It is because he attains this truth that we rightly say, he is the rule and measure of good or bad human action. Such persons are exemplars for those of us who are trying to grow in virtue, those who possess some practical truth but not the fullness of it. The fullness of practical truth requires both practical wisdom and moral virtue. These are the conditions of choosing actions that are practically true with ease and pleasure. We can see this more clearly by drawing on Aquinas on the cardinal virtues. The cardinal virtues for Aquinas being prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Aquinas teaches that prudence secures the good of practical reason through right practical judgment. Justice executes or realizes this good in external actions. Fortitude protects the good of reason by training our fears so that we can hold fast to the truth in the face of difficult circumstances. And temperance safeguards the good of reason against sensual desires that draw us away from it. Now, while prudence disposes a person to make good practical judgments, this condition depends on the person having rectitude of will, which further depends on having rectitude of passion and sensual desire. For fears and bodily pleasures distract the mind and cloud our judgments, which can lead us to perform actions that are unjust. So fear can drive us to abandon our friends. We might think of Peter denying Christ. Lust can lead us to commit adultery, and so on. Aquinas's definition of moral virtue is that it preserves reason. He is clear that in order to attain practical truth or exercise practical wisdom, one needs the moral virtues, a well-ordered soul. Now this leads me to my final point. One cannot see things rightly without wanting and feeling rightly. Disordered desire distorts our perception of reality in systematic ways. It leads us to direct our attention to features of the world that conform to our desires and ignore those that don't. Self-deception is a result of this narrowed vision of reality, a vision whose roots lie in a disordered self-love. In order to become virtuous, we need to be exposed to those who possess practical truth, those who live the truth and thereby make real human excellence alive for others. We need to see right practical reasoning on display in virtuous lives so that we can progress in virtue by imitation. Now, all this raises the question of how practical truth relates to truth simpliciter. On this question, which is of enormous importance, I can only gesture somewhat inadequately towards the shape of what I take to be a promising line of response. Someone who lives well possesses the truth in a specifically practical sense. But practical truth is derivative of truth simpliciter. That is, practical truth depends on having a correct grasp of reality.
A good human life is one that is in tune with reality, most importantly, the reality of the human person and its characteristic activities and goods. To realize the good and thus make true the description living well of one's actions in the world depends on possessing the truth about what sort of life is genuinely worth living. How we come to possess that truth is not something I'm in a position at present to explain. But I will say that what makes a vision of life true will be realities of the human person. And we must know those realities in order to possess truth in the practical sense. OK, so I want to close now with some final thoughts about living the truth as we can understand this through the extraordinary life of Elizabeth Anscombe. Anscombe's life demonstrates one final point, which is that fidelity to the truth does not make for a happy life in the sense of an easygoing life devoid of suffering, personal struggle, or pain. To love and to be obedient to the truth takes sacrifice and is often enough an occasion of real human suffering. Reality is often unpleasant. Living the truth can make you the subject of attack, arrest, and condemnation. It might destabilize family ties. Sometimes it can cost you your life. I think Anscombe understood this in a personal way. And though she did things, especially philosophy, the bloody hard way, I think most of us will look on her life with admiration and rightly judge that it was well lived, despite its obvious difficulties. Thank you for your attention. OK, yes. I said that disordered desire distorts our perception of reality because it makes us pay attention to things that accord with what we want and to ignore things that don't. So I think this is a very common and abiding feature of human life. Um, there's a lot of empirical social science that <laughs> points out all the ways in which we do this, that we kind of ignore what's right in front of our nose because what's right in front of our nose is unpleasant. Um, or it doesn't fit with our ends or goals. And so it explains the things we investigate versus the things we don't investigate. Um, desire tends to guide where we direct our attention. And so it's interesting when Aquinas discusses the virtue of studiositas um, versus curiositas. So studiositas is um, a well-ordered appetite um, to understand reality. Um, now, why is that a well-ordered appetite, right, um, is the interesting question. And I think what Aquinas is recognizing is that um, even the desire to know has to be well-trained, right, in order for someone to live the intellectual life in a flourishing way. Um, because a lot of things that you might know um, are trivial or unimportant. Some things even you shouldn't investigate. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that desire directs our attention. And when desire is disordered, it leads to a dis distorted perception of, of reality. The thing that you don't want to know is painful, right? So suppose that you're the CEO of a company that depends on exploiting fossil fuels. Like, you might not want to know so much about climate change science because that's, that comes into conflict with the way you're making your money, right? And so, you know, you might not look into that. Um, but why aren't you looking into that, right? And, the, and it's not that you want to understand things, you want to know, like, <laughs> you're, you're, sorry, you're not guided by this desire to understand the world. Sort of what's guiding you is making money, right? There's a disordered desire. Well, it can be disordered, yes. Definitely desire for, desire for money can be fine, but it can also be disordered. You know, she didn't write, uh, does she write about grace, Candace? She writes about sin, 
I can't think of any discussion. Yeah, so she doesn't, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting why she, you know, I'm sure there's an important story there, but she doesn't write a lot about what we might now call philosophy of religion or even theology, um, and, and I don't know why. Um, but I don't know what her thoughts about grace are. I mean, I could guess, but it would, it would be a speculation. So I think that it's not intended in the sense that most contemporary philosophers would understand that. So it's not the object of a propositional attitude intended. So it's not like I'm thinking in a conscious way, oh, this is acting well. Because that would be a stupid. Like we, one thing we must not do with Anscombe is attribute a stupid view to her um, because she was not stupid. Um, so that can clearly not be her view, but I think it's intended in a broader sense that the scholastics think of intention, right? So um, if, if you think about the practical syllogism and you think about the first, the first premise of a practical syllogism, its intelligibility relies on some vision of how to live. Um, and so I think that you can tell a story about how um, the intelligibility of the first premise depends on this, for this wider context, right, of that for the sake of which, and then I think ultimately we, we blow that up to living well. Um, now, you have to do some work to flesh that out non-psychologistically. -psycho um, so it's not... Um, it's, it's really a point about the structure of, of practical reason itself and its starting points. Um, now, Anscombe herself is not totally clear on this. So um, when she talks about whether or not there's a final end, um, she tends to say things like, well, if there were a final end, then certainly we would have a measure. And, you know, but she, she never really comes out and, and says, oh, yes, there's, there's definitely one that is, is the source and summit of, of all of this. She comes, um, her later writings, um, so she has a paper, Good and Bad Human Action, in which she sounds sort of more Thomistic about these things. Um, on my reading of intention, um, the account that she gives of intentional descriptions and their intelligibility is ultimately going to have to have that kind of an account, but I don't think she herself commits herself to it. And I think there might be a lot of reasons why she wouldn't do that, and not all of them are that she didn't herself believe it. Um, but you know, why should we think that that's true? Well, that's a long and complicated story, but I think ultimately it bottoms out in an understanding of the structure of practical reasoning and the nature of practical intelligibility. And so for every, for every end that you have, its intelligibility comes from an end, or the end itself is one of the basic intelligible goods. And I don't, now I feel like now I feel like I have to explain what I don't mean about basic intelligible goods, but you know, you can be charitable, you know enough about me to figure out what I do and don't mean by saying that. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story about practical reasoning in the end. So that's, yeah, so that's a thought. Um, so in an earlier version of this handout, which had the problematic feature of being over one page. I had a quote from Aristotle's Metaphysics talking about how truth comes in degrees. I excised that quote because I just wanted one beautiful page. Um, but yeah, Aristotle thinks that truth comes in degrees. Um, I don't, th I, I, I am in favor of that view. I haven't argued for that view. I think, um, I think that view is defensible. I guess that's really, and, and I'm not sure that 
um, that's so opposed to contemporary work. I mean, certainly formal epistemology thinks that there are degrees of belief and it's all subjective probabilities, and then they have a bunch of math. So I don't, I don't think it's hopeless. But I'm like, I'm not going to defend that right now because that would take, yeah. Um, oh yeah. So, um, well, think of the incredic, right? I mean, he's not. There's a sense in which, like, he's doing the right thing, you know? Like, he's he's almost there. Um, but the, but there's the, he's also falling short of human excellence, right? Um, but I actually think a lot of human action in various ways, so if you think about, there's so many ways that human action can go wrong. It's kind of depressing. <laughs> um, but you know, the extent to which it goes wrong, so maybe it's, maybe it's a problem in your thought, maybe it's a problem in your desire, maybe it's kind of both, um, then we can talk about, you know, degrees of truth. Um, I think where we don't talk about that is when, so there's a kind of error that I haven't discussed at all, and that's just when like the world doesn't do you a favor. So it's like you're, like you're fine, but then the world's messed up or whatever. So like I was all ready to give my talk, and then somebody blew up the building. Well, you know, that's not, talk's not going to happen, but it's really not my fault. But now that's a, we just run our, standard line on interference, right? Um, the world has to do you a favor. Um, yeah. But that wouldn't, um, that, that, that doesn't like impugn your capacity to get onto the truth. It's just that your capacity was externally interfered with. Yeah, well, you know, I don't think it's that hard to see when a human life has kind of gone off the rails. But, um, but I, I think ultimately what you're touching on is the relation of practical truth to just truth. Call it theoretical truth or what, whatever, just truth in the good old-fashioned sense. Um, and, yeah, so I think that in order for me to judge somebody's action as good or bad, um, you know, I, I have to understand the measure of them, right? So I, I have to know what it is to live well as a human being. Um, now how we come to that, okay, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, but just suppose there's some story about that um, that we can all believe, um, then that's the kind of knowledge that I possess. now. I can possess that not so this is what so this is a this is a feature that's interesting to me. I can be a total jerk and know the difference between right and wrong. Um, and I myself can be like basically a mess, um, know that I'm a mess, and so also be able to look at someone else uh, who's a mess and be like, yeah, that's a that's not going well. Um, so I myself don't have to be um, the beautiful, virtuous person to see error. Um, and and that, that itself shows that there are two different kinds of knowledge of human good, right? Um, you can know. So like I think it's possible actually for someone to be like a really good moral theorist. So like they, they've like got this beautiful theory of human good, but they themselves are basically a mess just a total mess. Um, and it's, it's very interesting that this is possible. I know people I will not name names, but it's totally possible. And <laughs> this, I mean, this was really striking to me at an early age and this thinking, yeah, there really is something different about a practical, <laughs> practical kind of knowledge. It operates in a different way. And it's not just about content because you know, the guy with the beautiful moral theory, like, he's got the right content. Like, he gets it, you know? He's got these true propositions, but they're not, like, they don't translate into a well-lived life. Now, how, how can that be? Actually, is a very perplexing thing, but 
part of, I think, the onus of developing an account of practical reasoning is, is explaining that. Because that's just like data. That's facts, right? <laughs> like, you know, philosophy should just make sense of that somehow. Yeah, so a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, so picking out the sphere of the voluntary, which would be the sphere of personal responsibility, um, is, is really hard. Um, I do think that that is part of the goal that Anscombe is, is, is attempting in intention. Um, I don't think that she thought she was giving a full account. Um, but I think you're touching on a really difficult and important question. I mean, even if like, even if we just abstracted from that kind of like really big picture heart stuff, like if you just think about tort law, <laughs> which I actually think a lot about, I find tort law really fascinating, um, even that gets really confusing because tort law is all about kind of like liability and damages and like what actually is the sphere <laughs> of my personal responsibility and what's just like things that happen because I did something and that aren't really. Um, I think that's all enormously difficult. Um, so, my, so I've written about this and my, <laughs> uh, I won't bore you with my own view, but I, I, I do think that um, a theory of, of practical knowledge is going to have to sort that out such that whatever can be said to be an object of your practical knowledge is going to constitute the outer limits of, but what gets tricky is negligence, which is actually what I'm writing about right now. Um, so ne negligence is a, is a is, re is really tricky, so that's like what you don't do, <laughs> um, but you're responsible for what you could have and should have done. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you're asking about, oh, well, you know, there's capitalism, and, and so, like, we're constrained in all of these ways. And that's true. Um, but even if, I don't know, even if we didn't live under the boot of capitalism, like, we'd still be constrained in all of these, all of these like, really obvious ways. Um, I mean, just the universe constrains us in very interesting ways. And... Um, so I think it's just part of human life that there's going to be some kind of economic order of things that's going to narrow down our options. But I certainly don't think it's the case, and I certainly don't think that Anscombe thinks it's the case that, well, capitalism, so I'm not responsible for, like, you know, these unjust things that I'm doing. I don't think she's going to buy that um, at all. I mean, I think she's going to think that there is still such a thing as wronging someone within a system of laws, and, and you know, you, you have to be held accountable for that. And, and I think she can do that and acknowledge that, you know, maybe the system of laws itself are a little bit... I mean, I actually don't know what Anscombe thinks about, about capitalism, uh, but whatever socioeconomic political order there is, there's still going to be personal responsibility in a, in a, in a sphere of personal freedom. Um, and, and that's going to get cashed out in terms of what comes under the domain of my voluntary control and what comes under that is, I think, going to be an object of practical knowledge. Yeah, so one thing that, um, so she doesn't write a lot about that, but one thing that she does seem to agree with Aquinas about, and this is a disagreement with Aristotle, it seems to me, is that people are perfectly capable of just doing what they know is completely wrong. Um, so like they don't have to be ignorant of the good. To just, so they can knowingly choose bad things. Aquinas calls that malice. Um, that's really bad. Like, like if you're doing like that, that's the worst way to be, <laughs> um, because you really don't have an excuse. Um, so like, there might be three sources of of wrongdoing. You just don't know. And then there's a question of is your ignorance culpable? There's all right. Well, you've got disordered passions. 
okay, well, you know, we can talk about that and whether whether and to what extent you're responsible for that. But then there's just doing what you know is wrong. Um, and she seems to agree that that's a real human phenomenon that deserves explanation. Um, but like Aquinas, so Aquinas has a theory of malice, which I wouldn't have time to get into, but his theory of malice takes the guise of the good into account. So he thinks, I mean, he has like a complicated story about how you knowingly choose a lesser good um, and how that's possible and compatible with a very strong version of the guise of the good. But he also has a theory of vice according to which the vicious person is after some real intelligible human good, but just in a disordered way. Um, yeah, so she, she herself doesn't say much about those things. Um, but when she does say them, she kind of does the head nod to Aquinas. So I, just assuming that she's sympathetic to that, but I, I'm not certain. <laughs> 